what I thought I'll do this afternoon in a short discourse is to share with you some very exciting developments in the field of medicine that are poised to transform the practice of medicine as we know it today. That's going to be the future of medicine, and it's going to be very personal. Briefly, what I'm going to say today is why personalized medicine? What is personalized medicine? What are the benefits and opportunities that this new transforming branch of medicine would offer? And what are the challenges associated with it? It's really the last bullet point that I would like uh, you to leave with this afternoon. The medicine that is practiced today, don't get me wrong, there are many, many success stories, but for every success story that we hear about medicine today, you can come up with a cartoon that describes nightmares, such as this one, or this one. <laughs> My favorite one. And we're going to come back to this cartoon a couple more times during the course of this discussion, because it really exemplifies the ideas behind the new branch of personalized medicine. I'm sure each one of you has a favorite cartoon that you have come up some time against. But all this is to summarize and, and say that the medicine that is practiced today is pretty much one size fits all within the limits of the usual uh, changes such as, or usual variables such as age and, and uh, gender and uh, body weight perhaps. So those are the parameters that we use within which we practice medicine that pretty much fits to the entire population or tries to fit to the entire population. Or does it really? The story that I'm going to share with you now really makes the point about what the drawback of this one-size-fits-all story uh, approach is. This is a Toronto tragedy. Not too long ago, in the year 2008, a Toronto woman gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Everything was normal, full-term baby, normal weight. And the infant was pretty happy, no signs of illness for about a week. Within a week, the in infant became lethargic and started showing some signs of illness, especially difficulty with breastfeeding. A Couple more days later, the in infant turned gray, was brought to the emergency room and on day 13, the baby died. Autopsy revealed that the baby had six times higher than what is considered a safe level of a metabolite called morphine. Where did this morphine come from? The mother was prescribed a very common medication, Tylenol-3, that's commonly prescribed to manage post-delivery pain. The milk of the mother showed 40 times higher levels than quote-unquote normal for morphine, 40 times higher levels. Obviously, the infant received the lethal dose of morphine from the mother's milk. This was the result, as we later found out, of a gene that the mother carried that metabolized Tylenol-3, which contains codeine, 
that gets converted into morphine in the human body so rapidly and to such an extent that it killed the baby. This was a common medication that is commonly prescribed to most women to manage post-delivery pain. <coughs> Clearly, one size does not fit all. That is where the approach of personalizing medicine comes in. This is not something new. People had realized or people had known for a long, long time, almost uh, since the 1830s, that our genetics has influence on our health. However, only recently has it been possible due to the technological advances and developments to practice what is now being called personalized medicine. So in a nutshell, what it is, you, you may hear it labeled as pharmacogenetics or pharmacogenomics or individualized medicine, but all of these terms refer to giving right medication to the right patient at the right dose at the right time. Again, I'm sure every doctor from times immemorial has always wanted to do that. However, using the patient's genetic or genomic information to treat a particular patient has been possible only recently because of some technological developments. So that's the answer to why now. The first and the most important technological achievement that gave rise to the personalized medicine field was sequencing of the entire genetic blueprint of humans, which was known as the Human Genome Project. Although it started as early as 1990 with some uh, model organisms, only in the year 2003 was the complete draft of human genome sequence known. What do we know about it? It contains about 31 million letters. Basically, it looks like this 31 million times. You'll get dizzy simply trying to read this. So we will not even attempt to do that. In a nutshell, here are the secrets that we have learned from this. Some letters in the individual genomes may vary from each other. Simply means that even though we all look alike, the 31 million letters in my body may differ from the 31 le million letters from your body from time to time. A feasible, uh, it's been feasible to obtain and compare the entire genetic blueprint of individuals in a population now. And that's the, that's the beauty of the technological advances in biology, computer science, informatics, computer engineering, coming all together in the last 15, 20 years, has allowed us now to do this in a uh, relatively easy way. What, what that does then is allows us to pinpoint even a single difference in those 31 million letters. Hone in on a single difference among those 31 million letters and associate or link those variations or those differences to the individual's health. That is the power of personalized medicine. Clearly, because of the tremendous opportunities and advances that this can make, uh, lots of stakeholders, lots of different groups associated with this particular area have jumped on this very quickly. First and foremost is the regulatory agencies. So for example, FDA, every drug that is being approved by FDA nowadays 
just about every drug that is being approved by FDA nowadays requires that you carry out, or the, the company that is seeking the approval, carry out the studies that look at genetic associations or the influence of genetic association on the efficacy of that particular drug. Needless to say, the pharmaceutical industry, for very good reasons, for financial as well as for efficacy reasons, have taken this approach. Science and technology is progressing very, very rapidly at geometrical pace, allowing these kinds of advances to take place. And better yet, the consumers are demanding it. Recall the third cartoon that I showed you earlier about where the uh, lady, a patient, was asking the uh, physician that she seemed like the dose was not quite accurate because she didn't feel the same way or she, they, she wasn't as happy as the person in the advertisement. Consumers are demanding this. So there must be some benefits to this approach. Let's look at some of those. And even if we discussed only this particular benefit, it should be obvious to you that this is an approach that is worth taking. The first and foremost is personalized medicine will reduce adverse drug reactions. This is the information I obtained from the FDA website. Today, the cost of adverse drug reactions is in billions of dollars annually. Last year, about 300,000 patients were admitted to the hospital for adverse drug reactions to drugs that have been approved by FDA. There's nothing wrong with these drugs. There was no mistake, no error in prescribing these drugs. It was just a case of wrong dose, perhaps, wrong kind of medication for the genetics of the patient associated with it. The costs of adverse drug reaction treatment are greater than the total costs of cardiovascular or diabetic care, causes one out of five injuries or deaths per year in the hospitalized patients, and the mean length of stay, cost, and mortality is double than that of quote unquote normal patients. Pretty astounding numbers. Personalized medicine will allow you to reduce, nay, even eliminate many of these costs. I do not need to emphasize the importance of this approach had it been taken for the Toronto case. You may want to talk to the parents of the baby and see if they had known the genetic variation that the mother carried, would they be prescribing this particular drug to the mother? And we don't even want to get into the cost calculations of that event. Yet another benefit, equally important, is improved drug efficacy as well as health outcomes. Personalized medicine approach will allow you to choose better drugs for particular patients and will allow you to dose a particular drug according to the genetics of an individual. Here is a representative set of data that I obtained from an article published some time back. And these studies have been reproduced and repeated across the world for thousands of patients, so don't go on the small number of patients that are reported here. In a nutshell, what this chart shows is the difference of dose requirement for a drug called warfarin. It's a blood thinner, very commonly prescribed blood thinner, which is also one of the three top causes of adverse drug reactions in the United States today. 
individuals that require as little as five to 10 milligrams per week to as, as much as 70 to 80 milligrams per week. Granted, majority of them fall in this area. However, there are patients that require very small amounts or patients that require quite large amount based on the genetic background of those individuals. Clearly, you wouldn't want to give the patient who is in this area 60 to 70 milligrams, or vice versa. You, do, you wouldn't want to prescribe two milligrams or five milligrams to the patients who fall in this particular region. So, allows you to dose a specific drug to the need of the patient, depending on the genetics of the patient. Better choice of drugs. Many, many examples. I've just chosen a couple of them here. There is a gene called HER2. If a woman is positive for HER2 gene, a particular uh, medication called Herceptin is very, very effective. It's totally ineffective if this particular gene is absent, therefore a different choice of drug can be used to treat this patient. I've never seen a, a more apt name of the gene that just happened to be, happened to be a, a, a biological name for that particular gene. Another example is that of an HIV-related gene, a B5701 gene. When it is negative, a patient can be treated with a drug called lamivudine. However, presence of this particular gene gives severe hypersensitive reaction to the patient, even causing death. Therefore, an alternative therapy can be, uh, an alternative course of therapy can be adopted. So, knowing the genetic background of individuals certainly helps. There are many more examples, but we'll move on to the next benefit of this particular approach. Here we have predictions of diseases. We can predict if the individual patient is going to get cancer, Alzheimer's, or mental disorders based on the genetics of an individual. Clearly then, there are several opportunities for this particular audience. I just chose to emphasize the entrepreneurial possibilities, areas such as genomic analysis, diagnostics, genetic counseling, and a number of other areas are very ripe for this particular approach. But this is not all easy. There are many challenges, and I'm outlining some of those for your thought. First and the foremost is financial. How much is it going to cost, and who's going to pay for it? Fortunately, as it happens in the case of any technology, the price is decreasing. The first human genome sequencing cost almost a billion dollars. Now there are companies that are promising your genome sequence for less than $300 by 2015. So that's a rapid difference. That's a large difference. Some of those companies are listed here, and there are many more like that. Another challenge is legal. Who is going to get access to this information? How is that going to affect my employment opportunity? Is my employer going to be uh, privy to that information? Fortunately, our lawmakers have taken substantial steps in this direction. They've moved very rapidly and passed a law known as GINA 2008, or Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008, that is a pretty good law. It's not, it doesn't cover everything, but that's a good start. Even Iowa, our own state legislators, have revised a genetic testing bill and showed us the way forward. Another uh, bill is in, uh, in, in discussion in the House uh, as well. So as time progresses, I'm sure this area will continue to uh, uh, progress and develop. Here's a cartoon that talks about the legal implications, <laughs> but that's a challenge. The challenge is 
more ethical than legal. Are we going back to the race-based medicine? Is this going to be an approach just for the rich? The days of blockbuster drugs are over. What is going to happen to patients that just happen to be in small numbers because of their genetics? Which company is going to develop drugs for them if they can only sell it to the point one pop person population? Who's going to take care of them? Important ethical questions. Do I really want to know if I'm going to get Alzheimer's when I am 75 years old or 80 years old? More important than that, do I really have to inform to my siblings? Do I really have to tell my family members? Those are very important ethical questions that I hope you all will discuss and debate. But there is one important challenge that we at Drake University are trying to uh, overcome to some extent, education. Who is going to train the professionals that are going to carry out these kinds of uh, experiments? Who are, going to, who, who are going to be able to counsel people? Who are going to be able to uh, treat patients based on these kinds of information? Uh, and, and education becomes a key uh, link in that. Therefore, we are trying to educate students, healthcare professionals, as well as policymakers. And this is my slide to brag about the new pharmacogenomics laboratory that we have established at Drake uh, College of Pharmacy and, uh, and Health Sciences. There are challenges, but I want to leave you with a story that's really heartwarming. Perhaps many of you have heard of this story of a uh, little boy called Nick Volker. Nick, when he was less than two years old, was diagnosed with a, um, a disorder, digestive disorder. Underwent more than 30 surgeries. Could not get any better. Researchers at the University of Wisconsin analyzed his genome and found out that there was one letter that was at the wrong place among the 3,100 million letters in his genomic code, just one. However, taking hunches from that particular information, that piece of information, they chose to treat him with stem cells. Nick is seven years old now. He's quite healthy. He's not completely out of it yet, but he's quite healthy very promising. So the future is very bright. And I want you to leave with that thought. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>